Grace. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to this evening's webinar uh, on the topic of social inclusion, uh, specifically uh, the importance of fitness of mind and body during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, focusing on how to age well. Uh, my name is Colin Regan. I'm the GAA Community and Health Manager for any of you out there that um, have, don't know me and are joining our webinar series for the first time. For our regular viewers, you're very welcome back to our Tuesday evening slot at the slightly earlier time uh, this evening of 6.30. Um, we're really delighted to have two incredible special guests joining us here this evening. Um, we have Professor Roseanne Kenny um, of Trinity College Dublin. Um, Roseanne is the head of the academic department of medical gerontology at Trinity College. Uh, and the founding principal investigator of the Irish Longitudinal Study on Ageing, known as TILDA. Um, it, this is Ireland's flagship research project on ageing, um, and the TILDA data set uh, represents uh, an unparalleled resource for understanding the health social and economic situation of Ireland's ageing population. Uh, and as Roseanne will remind you to, tonight, no doubt, we are all ageing uh, from the day we enter this world. Um, so in, in 2019 and early 2020, as part of a nationwide joint initiative um, with our, uh, the GA Community and Health Department and TILDA, Professor Kenny has been delivering her hugely successful how to age well seminars across the country um, and it touches on a, a range of topics uh, varying from exercise, diet, the importance of social connectedness, purpose, uh, location even uh, and how that influences our well-being um, uh, and how all those topics shape our well-being as we age. Um, our other very special guest tonight really needs no introduction to a GA audience at all. Um, Michal O'Muriarty um, has become uh, the face of the GA uh, in, and the voice of the GA um, and um, made himself available to us back in February 20th, 2019, when we launched our partnership with TILDA as an ambassador. Um, and Michal is joining us tonight uh, to have a, a little discussion and hopefully share some of those um, inimitable anecdotes that, that uh, flow so freely from his uh, memory database. Uh, Roseanne will be calling from a slightly different database. Um, so we're really looking forward to a, a stimulating and interesting conversation with a lot of evidence based um, information from Roseanne that we can all carry into our daily lives and is particularly pertinent during these COVID-19 days uh, and then uh, to be regaled um, by, by Michal but also Michal speaks um, very authoritatively on the topic of um, how he himself has managed his own health and well-being throughout his long and distinguished life and career. Uh, we also will be joined uh, online this evening by uh, Catherine McGuigan, CEO of Age Friendly Ireland, and Paul Gallier from uh, Age and Opportunity. And as ever, we have the chat function down the right hand side of your screen where you can feed through any questions to um, Catherine and Paul, and they'll be delighted to um, feel them as best as they can. We'll also try to filter some through to our two guest speakers and contributors, uh, Professor Roseanne Kenny and uh, Michal um, as well. So to get the, 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 the agenda started, and uh, as I said, we're going to have a, a presentation from Roseanne about 10 minutes um, on the evidence-based data that she would have collected through the, the TILDA research. And I know that Quite a few GA members um, have contributed to that uh, till the research by uh, becoming participants in it. Uh, after that, uh, myself, Roseanne and Michal will have a, 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 a chat about the, what Roseanne has covered and some of uh, Michal's own life. 
I'll be handing over to my colleague then, Ger McTavish, who is the National Diversity and Inclusion Officer, and Ger will bring you all up to speed about the great work she has been doing within the association uh, uh, in the area of social inclusion um, since joining the team uh, back in um, around July, August 2019. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll wrap things up. So we should have you for just about the hour and be finishing up at around 7.30. Um, so hopefully you're, it's all coming through loud and clear. Again, a big warm welcome and sit back and relax now for the next 10 minutes or so with the presentation from Professor Roseanne Kenny. And Roseanne, you're, you're incredibly welcome and we're delighted to have you this evening. Thank you. That's a great, it's a great honour for me again, of course. It's always an honour to share the stage with uh, me, Holloman and there, there, there can be no one um, better to, to share the um, secrets of successful aging with. We've done it a couple of times and I've enjoyed it hugely every time. And just to say to me, Hall, who's on the telephone line that I'm wearing my father's Mayo All-Ireland medal from 1949 tonight. <laughs> so he knows that. So I thought I'd, start, I thought I'd start by sharing um, a little bit about what TILDA is. And um, Colin gave a very eloquent introduction to the study there. It's, it's what we call a longitudinal study on aging. And what that means basically is we have the same group of people who we revisit every two years. So we understand the process of aging for those people. How an individual, say, who starts the study 12 years ago now has progressed over that 12 year period. And what were the things that we measured 12 years ago, which we now can, can, can look at through our statistical methods as predictors for their likelihood for getting COVID or possibly having a stroke or possibly having memory problems, etc. And then those early predictors, early risk factors, once we know those, then we can start working on those at an early stage so that subsequently you prevent um, the negative outcomes, if you like, that we would all like to prevent in order to ensure healthy aging. So that's what a longitudinal study is. And in order to get um, a representative sample so that I can speak and my colleagues can speak with authority when we say, Tilda has shown this, therefore, this applies to X thousands of people in Ireland over a certain age. It has to be what's called a representative sample. People can't come to us and say, I'd like to take part in your study. We need to be representative of the population. And in order to do that, we had to actually randomly select 30,000 addresses, knock on those doors, invite anybody over the age of 50, 50 up to over 100 who was living there to take part in this longitudinal study. And then that is our cohort. The study actually represents one in every 156 people over the age of 50 in Ireland, and it is representative. And this year we'll be refreshing the sample with another younger cohort because obviously our cohort has grown. So now our youngest in the cohort are in their 60s. And, <clears throat> and that way, uh, going forward, we'll be able to continue to inform policy, and it is informing policy. We've actually um, informed almost 70 different policy reports, policy documents. So it's terribly important from that perspective. So that's the study. And what do we what do we ask? We ask about social circumstances. By that I mean who's living in a household? What does the house look like? How many bedrooms, etc. in the house? How much social engagement? What are friendships like? How many friends do you have? What are your relationships like? How close are you to individuals in the family? Um, uh, we, we ask about activities, social activities, all sorts of activities, including, of course, sporting activities, including, of course, membership and participation within the GAA. We also ask questions about childhood because Colin already said it. Actually, aging starts in the womb. Um, and, and we know that the aging process, if children undergo stressful circumstances, can be triggered very early on. So we ask about childhood, childhood illnesses, childhood vaccinations, childhood experiences in the home, alcohol, physical abuse, even sexual abuse, and their schooling, etc. Emigration, 
20% of our sample emigrated at some stage and of course have come back. And we ask a lot of health questions and then we measure health issues. So we measure blood pressure, walking speed, memory, concentration, planning ability, mood, how you perceive yourself, etc. Lots of, of objective physical measures. So that's, that gives you an idea of the study. We do that every two years on eight and a half thousand people. I know there'll be some participants listening. And can I just welcome you? Thank you, because without our participants, our participants are now, for us, the TILDA team, part of this team. This team which has added so much rich information to Ireland and in the context of COVID continues to do so. So now I want to kind of tell you a few things that have emerged from the study because once COVID was announced, we looked back into the TILDA data set and we've actually produced six reports in the last eight weeks, repurposing the data set with respect to immunity and factors that we know matter for immunity and therefore bolstering our systems for COVID. So, so the, 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 the things that, for those of you who are home listening, maybe cocooning, I'm not crazy about the word, but you know what I mean, at risk and advised not to engage or go out, etc. I want to sort of, that, that's hard, that's really hard. And I think what we've been asked to do for the last eight weeks has been incredibly difficult. So what can you as an individual, what can we as individuals do to make that transition better? I'm going to pause and just say, I remember Michal was asked by Miriam O'Callaghan something around this, how is he managing? And I think Michal, your response was, when I get up in the morning, I go out first and I test the air. And I loved that, because that's such a positive start to the day. So I'm going to recommend that on my list of to-dos. Test the air. I think if I were asked, what are the two things that are really important in this context, in the context of our immune systems and maximizing our immune systems, it's got to be physical activity and it's got to be diet. So physical activity has been very difficult because the majority of people over the age of 50 who take physical activity, walking is their activity, brisk walking. And most of the research in this area actually is around brisk walking, a minimum of 30 minutes, five days a week for the cardiovascular system and for other musculoskeletal systems as being beneficial. So physical exercise is really, really important. Now, we can, we can start doing that now, that, that's, that the curtailment has been lifted. I know there were recommendations and good for Dahi O'Shea who put on a, an exercise program in RTE in the afternoons and to, to, book, to get people moving, etc. But it's hard when you're on your own or there are just two or three of you in a household and you've never done balance and muscle strengthening exercise programs on the spot before. It's not easy and I'm sure Michal's son can speak to that. But whatever you, however you can do it, take 30 minutes of active physical activity every single day. That helps the immune system. Diets. Now you'll have seen a lot in the media about vitamin D and much of that has been our work, if not virtually all of it in Ireland. And I'm glad to say as a result of the work that Public Health England, Scotland, Wales and I heard today Northern Ireland have changed their recommendations such that people over the age of 50 in the context of our current COVID situation and recommendations to stay at home as much as possible, stay indoors, etc., should be on vitamin supplementation. Vitamin D, 10 micrograms per day, which is 400 international units. And we're hopeful that the Irish public health will also address this issue. Um, so vitamin D. Vitamin D is really good for the immune system. Now, I am not saying it will stop you having COVID, there is good circumstantial evidence that it may prevent you having the severe cytokine inflammatory flush that we get with severe cases of COVID, which require ventilation, but it's not been proven yet, but it, it may be the case. And 
certainly it's good for bone and muscle and certainly we know that deficiency is really common in Ireland. Now, if you don't want to take a vitamin supplement and you say, no, 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 I need sunshine, blah, 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 fine. The foods you'll get it in are fatty fish, uh, cheese, eggs, uh, beef livers. They're the main, they're the main uh, 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 foods which provide vitamin D. And the other things, of course, is sunlight. Now, the reason that we high deficiency as people get older is actually the sunlight doesn't work as well on converting vitamin D to the active component in the skin. So it's why really over the age of 50, certainly over the age of 65, people should be on regular supplements, at least in the winter and spring, because in the summer we can store more through the sunlight and that takes us over to, to, to autumn. But deficiency is much, much more common in winter and spring. 15 minutes a day, between 12 and 4 o'clock of sunshine. So that's physical ex exercise, 30 minutes. Uh, sunshine to get your vitamin D, take supplementation, and then try the Mediterranean diet. Definitely no sugars. Keep sugars out, keep processed foods out, as much fish, chicken, but lots and lots of vegetables and, and fruits as possible, and olive oils. I think people are probably drinking more and we'll know that because we're doing a COVID um, um, follow up from the Tilda series now asking about alcohol consumption. But anecdotally, it appears to be the case, obviously, that we wouldn't be recommending that. But red wine does have uh, an antioxidant component. So a glass of red wine um, a day is, is good with that nice Mediterranean meal. Sleep. Seven to nine hours of sleep, if possible. If you can get seven to nine hours of sleep, that's really good for memory, for concentration, and for your mood. Social engagement. There's good evidence that it's beneficial to the immune system. It actually makes us feel better, but it actually acts at a cell level to make us be better. Now, it's hard. So we have to think outside the box when it comes to social engagement now. And I'm saying if there's anybody out there who can help others to engage, um, who just, to, you know, again, just go the extra mile. Think of somebody different every day that you can make a contact with. It'll, you, it'll, you'll feel good, but that it might make a big difference to that other individual. So don't, don't give up on that. Believe in yourself. Have a positive attitude about your aging. Now, this is hard because I've written quite a bit about this. The ageist attitudes at the moment that we're seeing in the media and generally are very difficult. They're hard for people to actually rise above as an individual. But if you can, do. Because the better you perceive yourself aging, the more you feel, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm me, I'm doing this and I'm able to do this and I'm going to do this and I enjoy doing this and I don't feel old. I'm not old. The more you can get that into your cells, into your systems, actually it has a knock-on beneficial effect on your health, believe it or not. In fact, people who positively perceive themselves as, as aging well, feel themselves as younger than their number age, their chronological age, live seven years longer. So it has a big effect on your physical health and your longevity. And, you know, re remain curious. Remain or be or start being creative and introduce variety in your life. When you get up in the morning and you've done Michal's testing the air, make a list. And make the list different every day. Get the exercise into your list, of course, but various. Variety keeps us curious, and curiosity is really important. So I think I've done my 10 minutes there, Colin, and of course there'll be lots of questions, and we can cover other issues with, within those, those questions if that's all right. That's fantastic, um, Roseanne, and a really fascinating synopsis of the... The, the web the seminar series I would have uh, experienced firsthand um, in, in the counties that we we delivered it in in, in 2019 at, at the start of this year and I think thanks so much Reid, especially for catering it 
to the, the current circumstances and obviously you've been working tirelessly to do just that and inform the public health response to COVID-19 as well. Um, so I think it, it po poises the perfect opportunity for us to bring Michal into the mm. conversation now. Um, and, and Michal, you've been listening to, to Roseanne. Uh, what has been resonating with you from what she's been outlining? Well, I was in Trinity College in the early days of Tilt. The first thing that struck me was the enthusiasm that existed there about this new thing. I hadn't had the word tilde before to explain what it was. That has carried on with it. And that's a winner when you go to meet people to convince them to do this, that or the other thing. And uh, looking forward, being enthusiastic. And I remember, and I often quoted, a quotation that my grandmother gave to the Folklore Commission when they were asked to give you know, our grandchildren were asked what the views of the grandparents were. And she mentioned it was a wonderful thing if you could wake up every morning, do shutla do shutla bracca on lay, to rise up early in the morning full of enthusiasm for the day ahead, no matter what sort of a day that you might have planned. Enthusiasm is a wonderful thing, and I advocate it to everybody. Now, age is a thing that I always said, we have no control over it directly by putting a time lane and limit on this or that. Now, I think the, the very beginning, I was always very keen on walking and doing it regularly. And I think that started, we grew up on a farm uh, east of Dingle, near the sea. And we'd be up maybe at half six in the morning to bring home the cows to be milked before they'd go to the creamery. And that was a job maybe should only be a mile away the field, but a mile there and a mile back. And then after breakfast, we'd head off for school. It was three miles to school. And there was never any question about how you'd go to school except to walk it. We'd be on the road for a while, take shortcuts through the field, the same thing coming home. So if you like... Uh, the tradition of walking and exercising and known to yourself was, has been there from the very beginning. I still keep that up. For years now, I could have had a pass to bring my car into Croke Park when I was commentating on games. I used sometimes if I was in a hurry and had to be in at a particular time. But I developed a habit of parking the car maybe a mile and a half away from the stadium and having a nice walk all the way down to Croke Park and to meet people and but keep going, the same thing coming back. Little habits like that. I developed those in relation to walking. Another thing, I never went to a gym. I never had a course that had somebody gave me to do. My own thing. Somebody, people, some people did mention to me, you can do an awful lot of exercising things with a plain chair. And one of them was, I was told, sit down on the, the arm of it, if it would be a big chair, fold your arms and stand up 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 times in a row without using your hands. Let it to the legs. And it was a good exercise for the front of the legs and the back and so on. That would be one simple thing. There'd be another one, you know, to keep the joints active and so on, the knees and the ankles. Again, you could sit in the outside of a chair and start swinging the leg back and forward and to come to the horizontal every time. That type of exercise, I was into those all the time. And uh, I walk around the garden and I'd walk, you know, uh, do a lot of walking, but wouldn't be planned or anything like that. I wouldn't be in for the racing or anything, but regular. Things like that. Something else, I don't think it was a factor in it. I never took any drink. Not that I was against it, but I, I, it never appeased to me. And maybe that helped as well, but I tried to keep active and get as much walking as possible, exercises and so on, play a little bit of golf. Some people say that it's a good walk spoiled. I think was, <laughs> some Englishman said that one time. Maybe so, but... Uh, I, I like it anyway, and it gets you to do five miles, maybe at a slow pace, but it's still five miles. And any opportunity I get to walk, I, I'll take it. I could be with others, I could be with my own. 
there'd be other things as well, you know, meeting people, discussing. I would never discuss health, you know. I still believe that I'm young. You know, that, that's what I say to myself. And I hear people talking about, oh, he's old now, he's 80. And I, I couldn't, I, I try and talk people out of that. Mm -hmm. Keep positive about it, looking forward, hoping that the next day will be great and that you'll be feeling great and so on. So maybe hold. some of that I do. And one thing I'd like to say, the modern players, and I'm sure they're the same in all sports, rugby and soccer and golf and Gaelic football, hurling, be it what, nowadays, once they finish with their careers, they retain their fitness. They're conscious nowadays of their fitness. So I must look after my fitness. I can uh, stop doing all the exercises that I did in training. That's a good trend as well. So looking around and helping people and so on and enjoying everything as much as I can. That would be my outlook. Well, I, I think that uh, Roseanne, he's pretty much a poster boy for the, the Tilda <laughs> research. Um, and you know, we have we have uh, an audience online tonight, many of whom we know are directly helping those that have been forced to self isolate during COVID-19. Um, and we did a re piece of research with our clubs over the last couple of weeks and about um, over 80 percent of GA clubs are directly involved in supporting a COVID-19 response for the most vulnerable in their communities and about 20,000 GA volunteers are supporting about 35,000 vulnerable people in their communities. And Roseanne, you, you touched on that point, you know, the, the importance of social engagement. Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes the focus is on the delivery of the groceries to these people, but the mm -hmm. feedback we have been getting from our volunteers is, is actually the seeing of the human face that that is the much more important part of that transaction. Mm -hmm. I I love the hypothesis of where where did loneliness start or where did social where did the the emotional um, consequences of being alone, the negative emotional, how did that start? And it started, this is the hypothesis, way back in hunter-gatherer times. So you had a tribe, some of the tribe had to stay back and tend to the domestic chores, etc. Some of the tribe were the hunters, and generally the hunters would go on their own hunting and 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 have a catch. Now, unusual, say, to get a deer or a boar or whatever. The temptation was to keep it for yourself because that was many weeks of food guaranteed. But our gene, our social isolation, our loneliness gene developed to prevent that from happening so that the tribe would continue and not become extinct. So the hunter needed engagement, needed people, needed to socially interact, brought the beast back to the tribe and everyone shared. And that's how uh, communities, communal living, but, 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 but also the emotional um, associations with that construct began. And um, yeah, I mean, it's very difficult to prove that, it's a hypothesis, but we certainly, as human beings, very few of us, very few of us don't need social engagement. And in fact, being lonely is as bad for your heart and for cancer as smoking and high cholesterol and high blood pressure because it triggers an inflammatory response which is similar to the inflammatory response which causes those outcomes. So it's, it's bad for us physically. So for all of those reasons, it's so important to engage. And it's also good for the person who's engaging. I tried to make that point. It's not just about the receiver, but the giver feels better. And believe it or not, there are studies which show that parts of the brain light up when when somebody thinks of giving to someone, giving money to someone, rather than making money for themselves. Mm. Wow. So if there are any philanthropists listening, <laughs> it does you good to give. <laughs> And, and that's a message we, we know from our own volunteers that you know there's a reason why they keep coming back to volunteer with the GA and the incredible time that they give. 
because they're obviously getting something from it, even at a subconscious level or, or cellular level, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, Michal, um, I, I've, I've had the, the, the good fortune to, to meet you many times in Crow Park now, and you said there that on I occasion- you arrived. On I met you very early on when you arrived in Crow Park doing the job you're doing now. I knew you were from Leitrim, and I had a great respect for Leitrim always, ever since I met Tom Gannon, who captained Leitrim to win the Connacht title in 1927. They didn't win again until well into the 90s, and Tom, the captain of 27, was there at that time as well. So there's something special about them. But uh, since you came in there, that feel that was given to you, I think that's working very well. People speak about it around the country. Now, one thing I'd like to mention is the smoking. It hurts me to see young people smoke. Mm. Don't know the damage that that could do. To them. Now, I was a smoker for a long time until I read for the first time that smoking was bad for your health. I never held one in my hand ever since I heard that. When I was young, it was spoken about that smoking was good for you you know, good for your health and all that. That was the propaganda at the time, but I'd love to see a big, big campaign, you know, to get across to the young people especially, that they should not smoke, that uh, they'll, they'll pay for it in later times. Mm. Uh, and Michal, Michal was ambassador with our Hurl the Habit campaign a, a few years ago, actually. And oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, a lot of, uh, you don't see any player. I remember now going to dressing rooms so I was. I saw the Mayo Cavanaugh Island final in 1948, and I've seen them all since then. I remember times going into dressing rooms and to be full of smoke. And I would say not one inter-county player now touches cigarettes, mm -hmm. and maybe didn't growing up if they had sport in mind later on. I think there's a greater understanding now of the damage that it can do to you, but. Um, I'd love to see if, if, if more people could give it up, but these the sports people, they're a good example. They don't smoke, they don't advocate it, they don't advertise it and so on. And Michal, you, you, you mentioned there, uh, and I think Roseanne, I, I'd love to hear Roseanne's take on this as well, around, you mentioned on, on the rare occasion when you might have been in a, in a hurry, uh, you would have availed of the car pass in Crow Park. You never strike me as a man that is, is running late, or, or even if you are, that you're in a hurry to get somewhere else. Well, would, I always like to be, wherever I'd be, to be there in time, you know. By being there in time, you could sense the atmosphere. Was it growing or was it static? Or, you know, it's good to be there and you'll meet the early comers and so on. And uh, it's all part of the day. And then going into dressing rooms to meet the players and they have something to say and shouldn't be that serious at times. You know, it's maybe a little bit different now, but uh, uh, getting to know the players as people. Mm -hmm. Getting to know them when they have left football, when they're no longer, you know, in the newspapers every day. Meeting former players, that's great as well, no matter what county they come from. And I always love to see something happening, something good happening that never happened before. Like a county winning for the first time ever. And there's counties, some, some counties a long time to win. For instance, that would be a very good example, awfully hardly. They never won a Leinster title until 1980, and there was hardly an awfully going away, way back to the founding of the GA. They only got into an occasional uh, provincial final. And then in 1980, out of the blue, only 8,000 people there, they beat the reigning all champions, Kilkenny, and to win their first ever. But then they were determined, and determination is a, is a very useful thing as well when you're promoting tilt and all other things. They won the, that one. And for a county that only appeared in a Leinster final occasionally, very occasionally, they went along because they were determined. They had the determination. They had the belief to look forward, we could do it again. They played in 11 consecutive ones. They won seven of them, and they won four all Ireland. All because they were driven on, this is good for us, it's good for the county, it's good for the game, and so on. And others have done the same thing. 
I remember Donegal winning football for the first time, Down mm-hmm. winning football for the first time, Armagh, Tyrone and Derry. I saw all those win a provincial title for their first time ever. It's great to see things like that, but what brings it about? People are looking forward, looking to five years ahead. We could be good by then. You know, the effort people put into it, the praise they get from people who are with them and wishing them well and so on. You don't know the real power of strength until everybody is helping the other. And this is a typical example now, the GAA, through Crow Park and till the coming together and other associations for the benefit of the community. Community is a great work. And mm-hmm. if you can bring that in and the communities will respond if something worthwhile is being presented to them. But I think things are going the right way. Mm-hmm. And um, Michal, obviously uh, you, you've been self-isolating out, out in Mead yourself for the last uh, number I'm, of I'm, weeks. Uh, cocooning. But okay. I'm not, uh, I come from the Gaelic area. Tom Egg Quaharu. Egg Quaharu. Quahar is the Irish for cozy. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, Egg Quaharu then, you're sort of uh, working on being cozy, being <laughs> happy with the way you're going. Uh-huh. And that's that they'd use in the Gaelic to Darrell Kinnaid, a farmer, Kerry winning captain that gave me the word for the first time. He would never use, you know, any other word for that, but uh, Ekwaharu. Fantastic. And maybe something the next time that I meet Roseanne, then she might have the word Kwaharu. I have it. I'm moving now. Yeah. You, 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 you've beautifully outlined the importance of purpose. Purpose is so is so important to you know you, you what, determination and purpose and there's no reason why we should ever lose having a purpose exactly. ever. You know to look at players nowadays they're very conscious of their fitness and that's a wonderful thing as well. Now the older players were but they they were soft to fit because none of them had a motor car not even a bicycle in different generations and they would be fit naturally. I saw a very good example once from Donald O'Cusick. There was a trip to Toronto. He was a day late coming. He had to go to Germany someplace due to work. I was in the foyer of the hotel when he came in a day late. And he came over to me and he said, now he still hadn't checked in. Where's the gym? That was his first question. <laughs> and I said to him, if we reversed it now, 20 years ago, somebody coming in the door, he'd say, where's the bar? <laughs> there, there's a great attitude among the young people towards fitness, and they like to retain it as well. Now, that's a good gospel to be preaching and to be selling, if you like. Keep it going. Don't quit from being fit and so on. But as I said earlier, my fitness wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be... Um, scientific or anything and I never had a coach and I never went to a gym but I I always thought I felt fit you know fit enough for me and keep going and Mm -hmm. saying to myself always tomorrow will be a better day than today even though today was a good day. (laughs) That's a great philosophy again. Uh, Roseanne I I, I just one, one wee question that popped to my head um, I was listening to a discussion on radio, I think it was yesterday, with a representative from um, Dublin Corporation, and they were talking about the need to maintain social distancing as people return to work, and particularly urban centres. And they were discussing the reduction of the green man time on um, pedestrian crossings. And I know your research had informed the extension mm. of those uh, to, to allow uh, for, for people to cross safely. I suppose that there's a lot of unintended consequences that will come out of the, the COVID-19 experience. But uh, as a researcher, um, is there also, uh, and I know we, we before we went live, you know, you noted, and, and we, we, it's so important to recognise that you, were, you would have even lost participants in the, the TILDA research due to COVID-19, and, and we think of all their families. Mm-hmm. But is, is, it, is it also, you know, as you look towards the next wave, will, will it be interesting as a researcher to see the, um, in, the impact of COVID coming through on the data? 
Actually, um, uh, we are starting a study in a couple of weeks, a, a kind of between wave tilde study, mm -hmm. trying to uh, unpack the impact that COVID has had on um, on our, our tilde participants, but on, on people in Ireland over the age of 50. And we've, we've, we've picked out all, virtually all of the elements we've talked about now, including worry Mm. and fear and what total isolation has meant and ha who they've had to assist, they, uh, who they're assisting. Um, employment, what, mm. what, what has it meant to them, their family, the whole knock-on effect. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so we're, we're actually going into the field with that mood. I think th this, the pandemic will have collateral damage and you you've really nicely highlighted one example of that it's not nice at all but i mean you've highlighted an example of that with respect to the traffic light signaling we showed that if it was just increased by a few seconds which dublin city council did and and i have wasn't aware of that so i'm really glad you brought that to our attention that x number more people it was something like almost 15 percent more people over the age of 80 would be able to walk fast enough across the road during those changed timings. And that makes a huge difference to independence, to mm -hmm. enabling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, the whole, our mission, our mission should be to help people to help themselves. That's what we should be about. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, we're going to ask those questions. Yes, we're going to try and understand because we need to understand not just COVID and, and the, the infection piece of COVID, but the collateral impact of COVID and understanding it helps people to help themselves. Um, and uh, I, I, that, that's our, our great uh, expectation. I was, I was on the phone to somebody from uh, Denmark today about a joint research study we're doing. And I was talking to them about a nursing home and nursing home patients, etc. They have virtually nobody in nursing homes in Denmark. They, for their population, which is just a bit more than ours, they have 3,000 people in nursing homes. They have a completely different model of care, of aging in place, which is the, the, the optimum model. Um, and uh, uh, even in those 3,000, their, their nursing homes are a home with, where nurses go in, but people have their own kind of apartments or, or rooms and facilities. It's almost like a shared apartment mm -hmm. for five or six people, not more than that. So, so the, the whole nursing home sector um, re, re really needs to be to re re rethought, and I hope that because that previously invisible sector has the curtain has now been drawn back on them, that we will use this as an opportunity to really make sure we do the best as a society for people as they get older, because we're all going to get older, and if we don't, we won't be around to know about it. Everybody. So you're looking after yourself if a society looks after people as they get older. Thank you. Might, might I add, you did mention, Roseanne, that people are visited again after two years. Yeah. That's a great idea to, to remind them, you know, uh, you know, how to keep fit. They'll be coming back. And it's a nice gesture to go back after two years and see how they're getting on and maybe lay out another few things for them and so on, you know, keep them in mind. And it's good for people to know that they're being kept in mind by others, especially yeah. older people. Yeah. And you uh -huh. mentioned standing up, the standing up test, uh, uh, Michal. That's really important. If, um, if, if we sit for longer than 45 minutes, there's a slowing down of brain blood flow. So even if you just stand up between long periods of sitting, just stand up for a couple of seconds even. It'll kind of restart the system again. It's like turning an engine on again and the blood flow will, will, will start to, to, to churn. So there was a study in England where um, more people, sorry, people over the age of 40 spent longer sitting on the toilet than they did exercising. So, so we have to rethink our whole way of our whole approach to exercise and our whole approach to moving and continuously moving. And as you've beautifully highlighted, it doesn't have to be, I'm going to go for my half an hour walk now. It can be, I'm going to walk to get the groceries today, or I'm going to walk around to visit my neighbor. Or I'm, so rather than using the car, turn it into a walk. Mm -hmm.
very, very good. Folks, I'm just, I know we could we could chat all evening here, but I'm a little conscious of time. I just want to remind the people online as well that we do have the Q&A function on the chat. Um, I'm going to bring in, if, if uh, Catherine is online there, Catherine McGuigan, I think is on, on the phone there. Um, actually, I think she might just have dropped off there now for a moment. No, I see I'm here, Colin. Catherine, how, how, how are you? I can hear you loud and clear, uh, Catherine. Oh, um, I know you, I'm sure you know uh, Professor Kenny uh, um, and, and, and um, Michal as well. And Catherine, uh, fr from the Age Friendly um, Alliance perspective, what has your own experience of the, the COVID-19 been? And any, any reflections just on the conversations being had here to this evening? Sure. Um, well, first of all, just uh, I want to obviously say it's always lovely to be in the company of Professor Roseanne Kenny and Michal. Roseanne and I go back a long way and I've been an admirer of her for a long time. I did tell my mother this afternoon when I was trying to get her set up for the webinar and she said, oh, is that that lovely dark haired lady from Tilda? So there's a lovely compliment for you, Roseanne, from <laughs> my mom in Clonus. She was all delighted to hear I was on a conversation with you. Um, but Roseanne has obviously been, uh, I suppose, the, the prolific voice of ageing in Ireland um, academically, the science and, I mean, just so passionate about so many areas. And it's so lovely to hear her because I hear, I learn so much every time I speak to Roseanne and I'm in her company. And the same with Hall. It's so lovely to be with Hall. The last time I think we seen Hall was when he launched the men's shed in Dundalk for us and came the whole way down and there was over 300 people there. And if there's anything that I, I just resonate with what Roseanne said, anything that epitomizes positive ageing in Ireland, it's me, Colin Herthig. So I'm delighted to be on the call, Colin. Just very briefly, just a couple of reflections I want to pick up, uh, particularly sort of what Roseanne said and also me, Hall. Um, the dividend that volunteering gives back to people um, is huge. The, 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 uh, the opportunity that they get to be altruistic and to feel that they've given something generous is a huge example. And we have so many older people, Roseanne, you will know this, that actually volunteer and were asked to cocoon. So actually when community mm. response teams were set up across the local government sector, there was a huge amount of volunteers that rang in over 70 and said, can I still volunteer, even though they were being asked to cocoon? But I suppose the, the recipients of all those supports that have rolled out across the 31 local authorities, they set up those community response teams. And Colin, it would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the role of the GAA supporters, volunteers, players, and their role in the COVID response. It has been absolutely phenomenal. And today we sent a report out where we've collated about 300 of the initiatives just to give people opportunities to see the like of um, the little responses above and beyond just delivering the groceries and bringing out the medications. But the initiatives really supported health. Uh, there's another, about, there's another problem. Problem. Oh, originated by Mary McAleese when she was president. She noticed going around the country that men that lived alone, mm -hmm. they stayed alone. Mm -hmm. But women yeah. that were alone, they had a habit of coming together. Mm -hmm. So she decided then yeah. to start something, asking the county boards and the farmers' journals and all these to come together and bring these old people, bring them to matches and things. Mm -hmm. And there were four counties tried out as an example, Wexford, Mead, Kerry and uh, Fermanagh. Fermanagh, yeah. yeah. And it worked extremely well. The GA clubs took them up and other clubs and so on brought them to matches. Mm -hmm. And then after a year or two, Mary McAleese organised, they were all brought together for a day in Croke. And it was a wonderful day. The amount of them that said to me, I was never here before. And a man from Fermanagh, you mentioned Fermanagh there, he said, I was in Belfast once in my life. I was never anywhere else except at home. Mm -hmm. He liked Crow Park and he said, I'm going to come here again. And it's going <laughs> on now, lots of counties now, they arranged that their older people brought in special buses to occasions. And I think that's an advance. I think events are springing up, the more the merrier. And I think yeah. there's a great understanding now between young and old. 
Uh, and I think that I think touches on Catherine's yeah. point there as well. It's Catherine, yeah. Yeah, just because the, the clubs, the GA clubs, there's 300 clubs yeah. involved, involved in the Healthy Club project now in partnership with Irish Life, who is also a, a CSR supporter of Tilda, uh, and, and one of the reasons we've been working with them. And they were amongst the first clubs that were able to mobilise their um, volunteer base in response to COVID-19. And, and you, I think you were just touching to that point there. Were. And just I think it's important just for me hold on that social initiative. The legacy of that has been phenomenal. I know even here, as you know, me hold I live in Clonus and we have a big pitch here and a lot of the Ulster finals and matches are held. And you will see the buses coming up with older players, um, you know, that have retired years and they get the opportunity. It's very accessible and they give them the opportunity and it's such a wonderful initiative. But it just touches on that point of the engagement of men. And I think Roseanne will probably be very familiar with that traditionally in Ireland there were poorer opportunities for men to engage, whereas women traditionally had those social networks that men didn't necessarily have. But I really think that the sh men's sheds and initiatives like that have helped it. But just on the community response team, Colin, I think it's important to acknowledge that work. One of the first community response teams that was established was in Limerick um, between the, the GAA club, the football association club, the Gardaí and the local response team within the uh, council. And to date, they've had 1,743 volunteers. They actually don't have enough jobs for people to do. Wow. If people ring in and they say, you know, I'd like my grass cut, can you get the prescription dropped out to me? They actually have so many volunteers. It's been overwhelming. And that shows, I suppose, a mighty civic response from our country and the way we've tried to respond to it. And I think, as I was touching on the point, is because there's a diversity among cocooners, as they're now called, and, and I agree very much with Roseanne on the language and how the narrative has changed and not for the better. But there are so many, you know, you might have older people and you might have younger people who are cocooning because they're immunosuppressed. And I think it's really, really important that people are aware that those community response teams are there. But Colin, I think it's important to acknowledge the work of the GAA as our own uh, sporting organisation, something that we're very proud of in our heritage and our culture. Their response to COVID has been phenomenal. Just two quick points, picking up on Roseanne's point, uh, absolutely with regard to the North European countries. Uh, they do integrated care and long-term care for older people um, in a very, very sophisticated way. If you look at that ratio of 3,000 people in nursing homes, in Ireland, our norm for people in nursing homes is about 5.4% or 4.5% of mm. people over 65. And Roseanne is absolutely right. We need to work at community-based solutions prolong the life of people in their own communities. And you know, Roseanne, the policy that came out last year about housing for our ageing population, it needs to be implemented, it needs to work with Sloan to Care because people want to remain in their own home. And one thing that has come out of this is if you look at that massive response, because it was coordinated at local level, if we have one legacy, is that those local responses should continue because they're the simple things that can facilitate older people to remain at home. It really is. And just mm -hmm. the last thing, Colin, in terms of the physical environment, um, I was on a call with the WHO colleagues this week and we were talking about some of the, the, the Nordic countries and uh, some of the far-reaching countries are already looking at. The physical environment is going to look very different. And Roseanne, we've actually had a lot of concerns from older people about you know, they, we have seen the transi transitional changes, but they haven't seen the way shops have a one-way system and all these hand sanitising and mm -hmm. what's parking going to look like. So there are concerns with people what the physical environmental is going to look like. Social or not social distancing, but physical distancing is going to be something of the future. And we've done a lot of work over the years on age-friendly towns and accessibility and making it accessible for all. But simple things, I can't emphasise enough, like Rosanna saying, the slowing down of the pedestrian crossing. I know it has an impact on traffic and all those other things, but it can really mobilise a person to be able to use their community, get into their own town, get actually, you know, start going to their own shop. So it's really important that we work with local authorities and, and that's obviously because we're hosted in local authorities, we'll be doing that to make them realise that those things are going to be hugely impactful on enabling people to come back into the physical environment after that period of cocooning. So not to ramble on, Colin, but there were my few key learnings out of today. Much, much appreciated, Catherine. Thank you very much for, for, for that input. Paul, are you online there, Paul Gallier, from Agent Opportunity? Paul, how are you? Thanks for having me on, Colin. Not at all a pleasure. Paul, 
Um, there, there's one question here specifically, and I know this is an area of expertise of your own that, that has come through online here. And the, the contributor is just saying that there are a lot of things online for people, uh, but that they, they have an aunt that isn't online, and, and I'm presuming here is, is social uh, distancing due to COVID. Is there any is there is there any particular programs up and running, or how how best to support? those individuals uh, she she's pointing out here that there, she's missing her exercise groups that she normally gets to have you any advice yeah, on so i do indeed colin and just as was first of all i just want to reiterate everything that um catherine said there the fantastic insight from tilda by roseanne so thanks very much roseanne and also i just want to thank michal for his infectious enthusiasm i think is the best way to describe it around movement um it's great to see that he's still he's still getting out and about and getting moving just in relation to your question, we, I suppose, what we've done, we've got online with a lot of our activities, and we, I suppose, we kind of connected with a lot of people. But you're right in saying that there is, you know, a huge number of people of that age, maybe that wouldn't be online and wouldn't have access to the internet. So aside from our online movement minutes um, sessions that we do three days a week, we also have some offline resources. Uh, we have fact sheets on exercise around balance, strength, and posture, which I'm sure you know for. Anybody that is cocooning is huge and vitally important now at this time that they keep on top of those key three areas that we would see. And we also have a physical activity DVD, um, and included in that are six sessions um, carried out by our trainers that people can join along to at home as well. And they will be quite reflective of the online work that we do. And uh, if people want to get in touch with us, Colin, we can post those out for free. I know we've kind of sent them all around the country so far. People have been making great use of them and there's been huge demand. Um, they can call myself on 01-805-7705 or they can email me. It's paul.gallier at ageandopportunity.ie. And I know that those details are probably put up on the, on the chat box as well. And once again, Paul, just to... Just to commend you on, on, a, on, a, on a fantastic webinar this evening. Thanks very much. Great to have you, Paul. I'm sorry to rush a little and just a wee bit conscious of time because um, I have to hand over to my colleague, Jer. All those contact all. details, all those contact details are up on the on the chat uh, on the right hand side there, folks. Um, there is I, I'm going to hand. There is one question that's come into Roseanne here that I'm going to come back to after Jer um, um, gives us a quick update on just all the broad work that, uh, that she and the Community Health Department have been doing uh, in the area of social inclusion. So Jer, take it away. Thanks, Colin. Um, just to um, to go through very quickly, just a short overview. Michal and Roseanne and um, Paul and Catherine have have touched on a lot of the uh, initiatives and a lot of the awareness campaigns that we're already running in in the social inclusion area. Um, so, what the GA is doing to make clubs more age friendly, disability friendly, and new citizens friendly. So, we have the education and awareness campaigns, the social in uh, initiative that um, Michal would have spoken about, were the activity packages to Pro Park and to other venues around Ireland, uh, especially with uh, GA history and um, also where GA members um, have fond memories of being there at All Ireland Finals. We also had the older adults engagement at nursery levels in the clubs where they were sharing their knowledge and their experiences um, and also training the future le uh, leaders in the in the GA. We also had um, the historian projects, which is um, about club members and diaspora who've um, traveled overseas and then have come back to Ireland as well. Um, and that's something that we could look at maybe in the time that we are cocooning is that finding those pictures and those old memories and those old newspaper clips um, that we can actually use and actually give back to the club or or to, to have an event at the club where it goes back through the history of the club. We've also had workshop, workshops in diversity and inclusion and also we've had seminars on embracing diversity which is um, engaging with the wider community um, and having seminars and music days and open days. Lon the Club and is, is one of the, the fun days and it's open to all members of the community 
to come down and experience the culture of a GA club. Um, and that's one of our, our probably most successful events. Um, we also, as well as that, would pick on the resources from our local sports partnerships. We would tie into Age and Opportunity and Age Friendly Ireland, along with uh, a lot of other sporting clubs and Special Olympics clubs, and also um, the libraries is a huge resource that we're finding. Um, so they are the local resources we tap into. So from ourselves, how to ask access a lot of those educational awareness uh, workshops is first in your club. It's It starts with an idea in the club. It comes to the GA for All, the Community Health and Wellbeing Committee. Um, and then it uh, goes from there to the Community and Health Department that we are in. And those workshops are delivered nationally across um, through the, the clubs themselves. We then, so I suppose the idea of this is just to give you maybe a, a plan for a social inclusion initiative. And, and this is a, a process you can start doing now at home while you're cocooning. Um, is that is the, the history project where you have the old memories, the old photos, the old new, newspaper articles, like Rose had the, the old medal that we, we would have pictures of that, that it can be showcased in the club. They're, they're hugely, they, they give us a, a great identity of the people who've gone before us in the GAA and also for the younger generations coming through to be, to be able to look up to uh, leaders and role models. Um, and what, what we I have coming up here now is just essential contacts for yourself. I know Catherine and Paul would have mentioned them earlier. Aid Friendly Ireland have a, an amazing website with daily news, national news, and also the local news, um, and they can be posted out to you as well. Agent Opportunity also have the same. So they have uh, contact numbers, and I, I'm just going to give you the Aid Friendly Ireland contact number again. It's 046 9097000 and the age and opportunity number is 01805-7709. And we also have age UK, which is 08000556112. And there are contacts that we will put up there on the in the question and answers as well. We have the NHS and the HSC, and we also have Rose's details there again, the contact for Tilda and all the research that she's carrying out and, and engaging with that research means that it, it, it helps us in our programs and our initiatives. Um, and then just the last slide I have here is um, our GA for All contacts. So the GA for All program is, is a program that we work with wheelchair hurling and camogie. We also work with football for all, which is in our special schools. Um, and their uh, contacts in Ulster, in Munster, in Connacht, in Leinster. And we also have a wheelchair hurling coordinator, um, Tony Wattini, and then myself as diversity and inclusion contact. So my number there is 01855-9891, uh, is um, and then we also have a lot of work with CARA, Sport Ireland and Inclusion Ireland um, for the GA for All programmes. Um, just so finally, just to say, Gurmila Magi Tasam Gawilsha, but as Michal said, a cool, um, a clocharu, so yeah. you're cocooning. Yeah. So we're uh, hoping that um, you're keeping safe and well. And I would just like to say thank you to the team who's who's helped tonight. Uh, Colin, Aoife Blon, uh, Aoife and Anthony, and also uh, Rose and Michal for coming on and Catherine and Paul. Just back to Colin there. We're just going to unmute Colin there for a second because um, can't hear him when we just pass it back. So uh, thanks a million, Jer. And that's just a quick snapshot of the incredible work that, that Jer and all our volunteers across the GA for all uh, voluntary committees at national, provincial and county level have been undertaking and are currently involved in. And obviously a lot of things that can be planned towards in hopefully later in 2020 as uh, we work through the phases of, of the lifting of the restrictions. Um, and I think Lorna Clubina 2021 will take on a, a whole special resonance within 
in the association and would be the opportunity for us all to come together again. Um, I'm going to do a quick round of our, of our two special guests just before we wrap up for the night. And uh, Roseanne, I'll go to yourself first. And one of the uh, uh, one of the questions we've had a few questions coming in, and uh, Breda Flood is uh, who has been a fantastic champion for social inclusion um, down, down in Wexford for years. Um, uh, what one of the questions that has come in here, Roseanne, uh, and I'll leave let you finish on this one before I go to Michal. Uh, it's it's about the reports that you, the six reports that you did in the last eight weeks, mm -hmm. and um, how that is helping to inform our response to the pandemic. If if there was one take home message that you were to deliver now to our guests, not just as them as individuals, but them as as supporters and guardians of our our um, older persons within our communities, what would that take home uh, advice be? Oh, oh, to double your engagement. Very good. I think I, I think that's as simple and, and, and I think something that everybody can take on board and, and, and likewise with Catherine for those volunteers that were looking for things to do. That's great advice as well. Just to uh, stay the course, double up, double down. Um, let's make up for the last time that we've all uh, had from our, our, our nearest and dearest and our new our new neighbours that we, uh, so many people have come to know over the last uh, two months as well and uh, continue this Mehill uh, tradition uh, long after COVID-19 stops. And, and Michal, uh, just to, to p pass the last word over to yourself um, as uh, I don't think anybody else could make um, cocooning has sound sound as, as um, enjoyable as you did. <laughs> Um, you, you've even transformed our understanding of the word from uh, negative connotations to something that uh, sounds appealing and um, uh, like, like a warm hug. So uh, Michal, just from, from your own, um, what, what wishes do you give now to those that are still still uh, tuning into us here and what are you looking forward to for the rest of the year? I think we have the greatest generation of young people that we ever had. That's very noticeable this year. and over the recent past. I think we should pay a lot of attention to those to go forward with a positive view. And I always finish up by saying it's a lovely phrase in Irish, that on this day next year, no matter who wins this, that or anything, may we all be alive and looking forward to yet another year. Perfect, Michal. That's a, 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 I can't think of a better way to finish t t this evening's webinar. A huge thanks um, to all the technical team and, and our team in the Community and Health Department that pulled this evening's webinar together. Uh, Jair, Aoife, um, Blanad and Anton. Um, a huge thanks to Catherine um, and uh, from the Age Friendly Ireland and Paul from Age and Opportunity uh, and a special Thanks to Professor Roseanne Kenny uh, from T the Tilda Project in Trinity College, Dublin. And a, a massive thanks to me, Hall and Murray Orthy for, for joining us and guiding us through a fascinating discussion. And just finally, a big thanks to our uh, CSR partners, Irish Life at both the Healthy Club Project and Tilda uh, for supporting our, our ongoing efforts here as well. So that's all folks. And uh, we look forward to, to tuning in to you again. We'll be issuing details of next Tuesday's webinar um, tomorrow or before the end of the week. And we look forward to you all tuning in again then. Slong, August Banner. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>